Hi, today we're going to continue our study of different models that try to explain what makes an effective leader. The model that we're going to look at today is called contingency theory. It's actually one of the oldest models that there are, and it's also one that has an awful lot of empirical support for it. That means it seems like it predicts what it's, what it's supposed to predict. It seems to, to actually work. Now we're going to see that the one of the problems with it, it has a fairly limited application, but um, because it does work and it does cause us to think about um, uh, leadership in ways that other models don't, we're going to uh, dedicate this whole chapter to, uh, to the contingency theory. Now let's uh, go over, start off with a general description of the contingency theory. It was uh, developed by a guy named Fred Fielder in the uh, uh, late 50s, early 60s, and uh, he's still alive. Um, he doesn't work on this uh, theory anymore. He's moved on to other things, but he's still strongly uh, associated with this. And this uh, contingency theory is a leader match theory, means that it tries to match the right leader to the appropriate situation. So it's not actually saying what a, be a leader should do in a situation. It's more of a theory of like, okay, you got this situation. What type of leader will be best in that situation? And so it predicts that the leader's effectiveness, how well the leader will be able to enable the group to achieve uh, its goals, depends on how well the leader's style fits the context. Now, we're going to see that leader's style is going to be different than style that we've used in other models. We'll, we'll get back to that. So, Fielder's, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, Fielder's recommendations about the best styles are valuable because they're based on empirical uh, research. Uh, there's been all through the 60s and 70s when people wanted to test out a leadership theory, this is one they would test, and we've got a lot of results and we know that it's, it's not as great as people first thought it was, but it does work pretty well. So let's take a look at some of the, the parts of it, or the, the main idea. And so the main idea is that effective leadership is contingent, that means dependent on, um, that's why it's called the contingency theory, on matching a leader uh, to the setting based on his or her style. And so to make the right decisions, we've got to make some assessments. First of all, we have to assess the uh, leader's uh, leadership style, and in this situation, we're going to see that it's a personality trait. It's something that's supposed to be pretty constant. It's not a choice of behaviors on whether you're going to be relational or task oriented. It's a more of a. It's supposed to be a fixed uh, trait, and then it's also supposed to be on um, uh, taking consideration different situational variables, and not just the. Um, followers' level of maturity, like we saw in the last model, and these, but these situational variables, like the leadership style, are assumed to be fairly constant, not changing from one today, one day to another, or another month from another. And these situational variables include things like the leader-member relationships. Now, member in this model and some other models that we'll see means followers or subordinates. Um, members of the organization that the leader um, wants to influence. Uh, it depends on the, the task structure. Is it an easy task? Is it a well-defined task? Do the, the followers, do the subordinates know what to do? Is it easy for them to do it? And then also, how much power does the leader have? Can the power, can, does the leader have enough power to get them to do it? Can he reward them? Can he punish them? Or does he just have to uh, charm them into uh, to, to doing it? So those are, that's a kind of an overview. Now let's look at what this means and what it actually uh, predicts. Now first of all, this leadership style, it's, it's a personality trait. It's a one-dimensional measure that is supposed to be constant in an individual. Um, and it's called the least preferred coworker scale. Now that is a strange name. Uh, what it basically does, um, they, and you'll see this uh, measurement scale in the self-test the, at the end of this chapter. Um, it says, think of your least preferred coworker, the person that you want to work with the least. Um, 
and usually people don't have too much problem thinking of one of those. And then they ask you a whole bunch of questions about um, this person. Is this person uh, mean or nice? And you have to choose some place along the spectrum to describe uh, uh, who that person is, how that person is. And you add up all the scores on this, and you reverse the scores sometimes, uh, and you get what's known as a least preferred coworker uh, score. And the people that don't think their least preferred coworker is that bad are said to be relationship motivated. And people that think their uh, uh, least preferred uh, coworker is the devil incarnate, they are considered to be task motivated, more task motivated. And so the, this leadership style is one continuous spectrum. And at one end, you have people that are, are motivated to, to their main concern is getting the task done. And at the other end are the relationship, uh, high, uh, high LPCs that are relationship motivated, who are, whose primary goal is to have uh, um, success in relationships. The, the good relationships are their priority rather than um, getting the, the task done. So we've got the L low LPCs and the high LPCs. Now, this is not describing what their behavior is. It's describing what motivates them the most. So this is different than a leadership style that we've been seeing before, which was a combination of different types of behaviors. This is a description of what people's priorities are. The second variable is the favorableness of the situation. And there's a, um, that means how good is it for the, uh, um, the supervisor? Is it really favorable? Is it likely? Is the success really likely? Is it really unfavorable and success is very unlikely? Or is it in between? And uh, in this model, there's three, three categories of, uh, uh, of, of, of situations of favorableness. And that's really important to know because that's what's going to determine which leadership style is the uh, most effective. Now, situations that are rated the most favorable, that's where there's good leader-follower relations, the tasks are defined, the followers know what they need to do, um, it's, uh, they know, if they know that if they do this, they'll be successful. And the leader has strong position power. And that means he's got reward and coercion power. He can, he can give them raises. He can fire them. Um, um, so basically, everything's lined up so that the, uh, um, uh, the leader can it set up for success. Success. So one way of thinking of it is that the, the employees love you, know exactly what to do, and they want to obey you. So that's like the most favorable situation for uh, um, uh, a manager or a, a leader. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum are the least favorable. That's where the employees hate you. They don't want to do, they, they don't know what to do, and they don't have to obey you. And so using the, the terms as before, it's, there's poor leader-follower follow, relations. Maybe they don't really hate you, but there's, there's tension there. They might not trust you. Um, there's unstructured task. Uh, they don't know what to do. Success isn't very likely. Nobody knows what's really going to make things work. And the leader doesn't have any uh, power to reward or punish them. Uh, there's just the uh, um, the... The, the workers are, are, will, not be, uh, will not suffer negative consequences or will not suffer direct physical benefits from doing what the, um, the leader wants. So that's like um, they, they don't have to, uh, to obey the leader. That's what the least favorable situation is defined as. And then there's moderately favorable situation. These are the medium ones. These, are, these fall in, we've got the two extremes, and the moderately favorable situations fall in between these extremes. Now, what this um, leadership model pr predicts is that given, okay, in these boxes here are different um, conditions where you have like this top line is like leader-member relationships. They could be good or poor. You've got tax, task structure um, where it's high structure, they know what to do, low structure, the employees don't know what to do. And then you've got position power where the leader has 
lots of position power or weak position power. And you've got t a total of eight combinations of these uh, uh, favor that determine the favorability of the uh, situation. Now, what this model predicts is that when in really unfavorable situations, so over here where it says eight, leaders with low LPCs, ones that are totally focused on the task or more focused on the task than, uh, than on the relationships, in these kind of hopeless situations, these unfavorable situations, um, low LPCs will do better than high LPCs. Now, in uh, um, the, uh, the situations that are in between, where you've got a combination where some things are favorable, some things are unfavorable, people that are high LPCs do the best. And then over here, when the situation is really, really, really good, once again, low LPCs tend to, to, to do the best. Now, they've in this figure, they've put lines down here because in Fielder's original theory, he thought that this is where the lines belonged. It turns out that maybe the lines separating these, maybe this line should be pulled over this way. We know that in really favorable situations and really disfavorable situations, people with low LPCs are more productive than people that are, um, have high LPCs. And in situations that are kind of in the middle here, people with high LPCs have better outcomes than people with low LPCs. The, the exact position of the line, the, the data has, doesn't always uh, uh, con conform to uh, this model that's described here. But the idea is, is that when things are totally hopeless, Leaders that aren't very concerned about relationship, that are going to focus all their effort on the task, the, um, the, they're going to be more successful than people that are really concerned about relationships. Uh, and also when things are going really, really well and all the relationships are good and the leader can get people to do everything, the leader, the leader that's focused on the task rather than the relationships will uh, also do better. But in between, it's better to have a high LPC, to, have, uh, to be more motivated by um, get, having the, the right relationships uh, so that people can coordinate their effort. And like I said, this is, this is pretty well empirically supported. The exact position of this line, maybe push it over here. That might be better. That, it works out good. So here's, here's another way of looking at it. And it says that given the favorableness of the situation, it says here's the LPC score of the most appropriate leader. In very favorable situation where everything is peachy keen and going smoothly, low LPC people are the best, ones that are um, uh, uh, really focused on the task. And the same thing in the very unfavorable things, the situations are out of control. Um, the person that says, we're going to get the task done, we're not going to focus on being nice to each other, we're just going to work and we're going to give it our all, it's um, uh, well, success or failure are the only two options. It looks like failure is, is, is most likely unless we give it everything that we got. And um, those type of leaders tend to do better in the, uh, uh, the situations that are out of control. But in the moderately favorable situations, situations with some degree of uncertainty, not completely in or out of the leader's control, uh, the people with the high LPCs uh, do better. People that uh, uh, are more concerned about the, the relationships because they can get everybody to, to coordinate their efforts to make success more likely. Now, the strengths of this theory is that there's empirical support. It's been tested by many researchers and it generally works. The exact definition of what very favorable and very unfavorable isn't always uh, uh, clear, but we know that those extremes, low LPC people do better. Um, it, another advantage is that it places the emphasis on the demands of different situations. It says that the situation has a big impact on what leadership is going to be most effective. Um, we saw in situational leadership, it only depended on the developmental stage of the follower. Here, we're looking at all kinds of uh, things that, uh, um, that influence what type of leadership is appropriate.
And also, it helps leaders realize that, um, uh, uh, that, that they're in the wrong uh, position, that this place is not right for them. I, uh, um, even though you might not be able to tell it because I'm sitting here trying to have a close relationship with a little camera on a computer screen, I'm generally a pretty relational uh, guy. And my LPC scores are, uh, they used to be really high. Then I had one uh, supervisor that caused me to have lower LPC scores, but that's another story. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a pretty high LPC, uh, 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 I have a pretty high LPC score. And I can look at the situations where I have not been the right leader, and they have been at the two extremes. I, uh, um, especially one, I remember, I'm just thinking, it was like um, a really, really hopeless situation. And I was kind of paralyzed, because I was like, oh, I'm really good at trying to get people to work together, but that, that's not happening now. Um, and probably some leader that had gotten in that had just getting everybody in line, kicked out the people that were uh, uh, causing the team to, to go under, someone that was a lot less relationship-oriented, would have done a lot better. And um, so I can see that I'm not going to be very effective in the, uh, the very favorable or the very unfavorable situations. Um, so this means that companies should strive to place leaders in optimal situations according to their leadership style. If they know that they're LPC uh, people, they should put them in the most extreme or the least extreme situations, and the high LPC people should go in the in-between uh, situations. Now, there's a lot of criticisms of this uh, model also. This LPC, the least preferred coworker scale, is an indirect measure of personality. They're asking you, describe your least preferred coworker. So you're actually describing somebody else rather than yourself. And so what this means is we don't really know what it measures. We know that it, it effectively predicts what type of situation you'll be in, and we think that it measures how motivated you are to have healthy relationships or how motivated you are to uh, um, focus on, on the task, which one's your priority, but we're not actually uh, uh, sure. Uh, like I said, the... Uh, um, the LPC score can vary depending on who your least preferred coworker school is, uh, least preferred coworker score is. Uh, if you like everybody and you've never had a bad uh, coworker, um, even if you're not a very task-oriented person, you might have higher LPC scores than somebody who's really focused on relationships and has worked with a um, total. Uh, unskilled person. Uh, so uh, and I, I can see that in, in my own life too. Up to about nine years ago, my LPC scores were really high, and then I had one supervisor, uh, half the organization left under his two-year leadership. It was just a total disaster. Um, it was just painful for everybody. I had to leave the organization eventually. It was, it was just a disaster. The, the organization, once they got rid of him, went back to normal. But I, my LPC scores went down because my new reference point was someone else um, compared to who it had been before. So um, it's, uh, um, it's fairly, uh, the, the LPC score can, we're not sure what it's measuring. It can be pretty variable. And it shouldn't be variable if it's really measuring a personality uh, uh, concept. Now, it's more useful in the, the hiring process than once a leader is in a position, because this model basically says, aha, this type of leader is, in, uh, is best for this type of situation. So if you know what type of situation it is, you can hire the right uh, person. Now, once you're in a situation, it doesn't really tell you anything except maybe you should resign. Um, but a lot of people would rather try changing the favorableness of the situation rather than resign. And most uh, uh, organizations don't want to continually be changing uh, managers and, and supervisors. And so we can actually say that it's not useful if the favorability of the context, if the situation changes more often than the leadership. If you want people to be in a position for at least two, three years, 
uh, this theory only works if you know what the situation will be for those two or three years if it's fairly stable. And in the changing environment of uh, uh, organizations today, that might not be a very good assumption. Uh, things that are least favorable uh, this month, things could get better. There's not a good chance that they're going to stay least favorable for two or three years. And things that are the most favorable for two or th uh, right now are likely not to be most favorable during the, the tenure of the, uh, the leader in the organization. So there's a lot of limitations to this uh, 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 theory. It doesn't really tell the leader what they should do. It just gives them information about how leadership uh, actually functions. So it's uh, uh, another piece of the puzzle that you can use to help evaluate what situation you're in, why things are going that way. Perhaps if you're hiring someone, it can uh, give you some, uh, um, some insights. Um, but it's, uh, it's fairly limited in its application.